Um, so if you are watching this on YouTube, just in case, I'm going to be playing this league with Mono White Taxes, a 24 land version. Um, since I thought the, the build was relatively heavy with, uh, with cards that cost three or more, both in, both in the main deck and in the sideboard, I'm going to try a couple of leagues with 24 lands to, to see how it performs. Um, I've, I've done sort of a lot of chatting about the deck already, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and just hop into leagues here. Against Cruiser. No results found for that player, so we will just go ahead and keep a hand that is reasonable. This hand is weak. It has two Ether Vials and some Crusaders, and Crusaders a great card. Uh, this will be a fine hand against a fair deck, but a bad hand against an unfair deck. Uh, on the draw, I'm fine with keeping this. Um, but if our opponent is playing like Ant or something like that, we're super dead. Yeah, like if this is just going to be like some Deathrite Shaman deck, then having a double Crusader hand is going to feel really great. Thought sees me. <clears throat> we'll lead on snow covered plains over plains because the art's better. Alright, my opponent has successfully dealt with both Aether Vials. But I still have two Mirror Crusaders, and they're a black deck. So this is probably fine. Would I lead on regular planes if I had better art? Absolutely. But this is just the default plan planes that they have on Moto, and I'm not I'm not a fan. My opponent did not shuffle with Ponder, so they liked whatever they had. Stoneforge is a great draw. So I actually want to, I think, get Jitte here. Um, like, Batter Sculling and forcing them to answer the Stoneforge seems great and all, but I think my plan is just, like, jam Crusader, plan on putting Jitte on Crusader and just winning this game. My opponent preemptively fetched on their turn, but didn't do anything. Uh, maybe playing around something random like Aven Mind Sensor. 
They might have preemptively doing that because they plan on hard casting a daze on this first Mirror Crusader that I'm going to deploy. But I don't think we play Mirror Crusader to not jam Mirror Crusader, so let's do it. Show me a daze. Oh! We'll attack with the Stone Forge. My opponent does something cute, like plays an Ambush Viper. They can have it. I'd really like my opponent to show me another color before I go to the next game. Because they played a Thoughtseize, which is a little weird. Not, like, unprecedented by any means. I kind of feel like they're a Delver deck, but I haven't, like, confirmed if they're Grixis Delver or if they're Bug Delver, or they could just be some Brew as well. My phone is dead. Yeah, my phone is just dead. Alright, great. So I was on the draw that time. And I won. I played against Cruiser. Game one, we just won with Crusader and Jitte. My opponent expended their initial resources keeping both of my ether vials off the table because they were scared of those, but that meant that they didn't have any answers to the Crusaders in my hand and the random Stoneforge that I drew. Um, so, since we saw that daze, I, I am assuming that my opponent is on Delver and just had an absolutely bad hand. Now, there is the chance that my opponent is not on a Delver deck and that they are instead on some, like, homebrew control deck. Um, that is something that could occur. Um, so, for example, they could just be on, like, a random, like, bug Leovold control deck. They could be on a standstill deck. Um, like, there, there are options for what they could be on that might punish us if we sideboard directly for Delver. Why was there a swamp? Yeah, see, that, that's a great question that, like, makes me hesitant to say that they're Delver. Like, we saw this Daze, we saw this Thoughtseize, all that early interaction, but we might not actually be looking at Delver. I, like, I don't, I don't know. I think I'm 100% boarding in these resting pieces. They're probably good against whatever my opponent is doing. Like, if they're a Delver deck, it'll be good against, like, the Deathrite Shaman, Gurmag Angler side of things. If they're a control deck, that'll be good against them. Um, like, maybe they're just something weird like Shardless Bug. Alright, I'm gonna assume... Like, Reanimator is not out of the picture, either. I'm gonna assume that these Revokers are probably bad against what my opponent is doing. And I'm gonna cut a Flicker Wisp. And then I think I just kind of submit a reasonable deck list for the next game and then sideboard properly in between rounds. So like I think I'm just gonna run something like this and see where this goes. Uh maybe boarding in these council judgments and pulling one maybe we'll we'll pull out two sorts of plowshares. 
I don't know. We'll try something like this and, and see what's going on. Despite the fact that we're on 24 lands, I am mulliganing like I am playing no lands in my deck. This is ridiculous. <laughs> this hand is awful and does nothing. But I'll keep it and hope to scry something relevant to the top. Like, I don't want to go to four when I don't even know what my opponent is playing. Uh, my opponent showed me a basic swamp. They might have other basics as well. They could be a Deathrite Shaman deck. They might be Reanimator. Um, I'm going to send this to the bottom. I guess my opponent just did a check to see if I was F6 or not by brainstorming in their second main phase. Shuffle away a wasteland, draw another wasteland. Should run less than 40 lands in this deck. Sure, I agree. I'm gonna jam a Crusader here. Um, like it's more or less confirmed that my opponent is probably on Reanimator at this point, um, and I need to put some some clock in play. But, like, I can't just port them down forever, um, since they can operate pretty well on a low land count. Yeah, I, I, have, I have drawn lands at pretty much the exact opposite times of when I wanted to draw them uh, for most of today. I, I've had almost no lands in my opening hands, or too many, and... Um, I flooded out a few times and been mana starved a few times. Like it, like it happens. I'm not I'm not too too upset about it. Um, still a little salty about that double diabolic edict loss against Delver, but other otherwise I'm fine with what's going on. So if our opponent is on Reanimator, then I've got a few more cards that I'm going to want to board in for the next game.
I guess the good news is that my opponent doesn't have a second land. So, like, there is that. They do have all these Lotus Petals. So those are sweet. My Revokers are in my sideboard, aren't they? Yeah, that's unfortunate. Revoker on Lotus Petal would be gas. with this Thalia draw, though. Uh, that's very good. Now it costs my opponent two Lotus Petals to do anything, or an instant speed during their upkeep would be like Island plus a Lotus Petal. Uh, we're getting out of the range where something like a Grizzle Brand actually matters. Alright, there goes a Lotus Petal. Alright, they get a careful study. Blazing Archon. Creatures can't attack. Creatures can't attack you. Alright, that, that's annoying. Man, after all of that, my opponent didn't hit a land. They are, they are feeling the RNG as well. So I'm going to crack this horizon canopy right now. I don't actually need to play this batter skull at all. My opponent's dead to my board. Uh, do I want to play this stoneforge? Yeah. Not really a reason not to. It, like, if my opponent does manage to get the Blazing Archon into play, then it gets another card out of my deck and digs me towards a card that can deal with the Blazing Archon. Uh, we've got, like, four... No, we got, like, eight outs to it in our deck. So our opponent essentially needs to draw a land and have a spell that somehow gets the Archon into play that's not reanimate. So they would need like a Dark Ritual plus like an Exhum or something of that nature. Ooh, Massacre. Okay. Massacre is solid. Uh, Recruiter for Containment Priest is just better though. So I'm just going to think through what I want to do. If I play this Cavern of Souls, then I can make both Recruiter and Containment Priest uncounterable. Or I can expose myself to a counterspell, but wasteland them off of black. Oh wait, hold on. Check. Did I board in Containment Priest? I did not board in Containment Priest. So that means I need to stay on the Mana Denial plan. So, in doing so, I will fetch a Thalia. So I can go Recruiter, Thalia, and Wasteland you, and leave myself in a very good position. Uh, if my opponent has a Force of Will, and they Force of Will the Thalia, 
that's not great for me. Uh, so what I'm going to do is actually lead on recruiter and not make it uncounterable so that I can make Thalia uncounterable and wasteland them. And if they do counter this, then I will um, just port and waste them. All right, they are f6. So we get Thalia. Thalia resolves. Play Wasteland. Wasteland Underground Sea. And we'll we'll give our opponent a turn to draw out of it, but their their hand has seemed pretty awkward. Oh, my opponent reanimates a Thalia, and to that I say, deal. Um, that's sort of interesting. So, I don't really want to let my opponent get their Thalia out of play. I actually want to leave that in place so they can never cast anything. Um, and what I'll plan on doing is just like suiting up um, one of my guys with uh, with Batter Skull a couple of turns down the line. Uh, so what can I draw that I would want to make uncounterable? It's mostly all humans at this point. I guess making Flicker Wisp uncounterable seems fine. That way if they get uh, the Blazing Archon into play, I can do something about it. So I can't cast the Batter Skull right now because it would cost 7 mana. Uh, so what I can do is cast this Jitte, pass the turn, port them, and they're pretty well locked out. Oh, hey, Red Twister, thanks for stopping by. I don't know that I've ever played se paid seven mana for a batter skull before. This is new and exciting. Alright, my opponent has conceded. Alright, so we actually played against Blue Black Reanimator. We weren't sure of that after game one. We we're on the draw here, and we won. So really, we won this match with Athalia after my opponent misses land drops. All right. Back in the queue we go. Uh, for those of you who are just joining in, like Red Twister, um, here's what we're playing. For today, uh, we're trying out a mono-white build with a 24th land, still the four Mirren Crusaders. We cut a Revoker for the 24th land. Uh, we're trying out a slightly different sideboard package that includes Elspeth, Knight, Errant, and Cataclysm, uh, in addition to most of the usual stuff that I'm doing. Um, I cut the Gideons and the, uh, the Surgical Extractions for these four lands.
we are playing against Frizzeal. I know I've played against this person before. Alright, I need to check my own data. Uh, they are an ant. Uh, do I want to keep a hand against ant that has a sanctum prelate when I am on the play? Or do I want to mulligan for a Thalia? That's a real question. Uh, turn three is usually too slow for ant in game one. I'm gonna mulligan and try to find a Dahlia, I think. Uh, this hand is, is sort of justifiable because it has the Stone Forge. Like, the Stone Forge can fetch the Batter Skull, and if my opponent goes on and empty the Warren's plan, I might be able to beat that. So, like, that plus the Prelate might be enough. Uh, I'll think about this one for a second. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff appeared in chat. Uh, why do you like Knight Errant over Gideon? Uh, I don't know that I do. I'm trying it out. Uh, a lot of people on the like the source and Reddit have been saying that they're they're running one um, because they really like it with Crusader. I don't know that I can throw back a hand that has a prelate. Like prelate on four in game one is just absolutely game winning. So if my opponent stumbles, I might just win. I'm gonna keep this one. Um, I have not yet had the Elspeth in play, so I can't actually remark on how good it really is. Two power says keep my man. I, I think it's close. Like, mulliganing for Athalia. Like, if I hit the Thalia in the two lands to play it and deploy it on turn two, I probably win. But, like, prelate on turn three 100% wins the game. Like, there are, there are no outs to that. So my opponent would have to Cabal Therapy that card away. I, I don't know that I can throw away a, a hand that, like, has 100% win rate if my opponent stumbles. Like, I don't think I can do that. Ooh. Ooh, that was a good draw. The heck with this Stoneforge. Other than just drawing something like a Thalia or a Revoker, that was one of the better draws in the deck there. I was gonna say, if you draw a port and this hand is really good, yeah. Yeah, that uh, that was a nice draw. So like, as far as things that would have made this hand insane, drawing a Thalia was great, drawing a Port was great, drawing a Revoker was great. So that's ten cards that we have that can make this hand just kind of nutty if we draw them. Um, and that's probably enough. Like, my opponent might just like fe fetch Dark Ritual and do their whole thing here. Um, but if they don't, I just win. You shuffle with his Ponder turn one. My opponent did not shuffle with the Ponder. So, like, even if it's not safe, my opponent has to go for it right here. So we might see them, like, go for an ad nauseum kill that's a little bit risky or something like that. Well, my opponent's hand looks stacked from, uh, from what I have here. Uh, my opponent was brainstorming there purely to use the mana, because they have to go off this turn or they die. Like, non-negotiable non Sanctum Prelate on 4 against Ants in game 1 is 100% game winning. There are, there are no outs to that, there's no random bounce spells or anything of that nature that can get my opponent out of it. Well, Infernal Tutor and then cracking two LEDs seems bad for me.
Oh, my opponent had the tendrils, so they're gonna get a pass and flame skill here. Uh, I revoke LED blind against Ant. And I will concede so they don't have to click through all of that. Alright, so, uh, what do we board in? We board in Canonus. They're an amazing hate card. We board in Rest in Peace. Shutting off Past and Flames is amazing. I usually preemptively board in Council's Judgment to stop Dread of Night and Sanctum Prelay. Uh, I'm going to check my previous notes against this player to see if I know if they play Dread of Night or... or Massacre. I do not know which they play. All right, so I will start by boarding out my swords to plowshares. They're not necessarily uh, good here. Um, I don't need most of my equipment package. I'll probably bring in Sword of War and Peace over the other stuff that I have. Probably drop a Flicker Wisp. Can probably cut one land pretty safely. Go back down to the regular 23. This isn't a matchup where I need to hit a billion land drops. Um, if I had more hate, I'd probably drop like a couple more stone forges. I can probably just drop one and then board like this. Um, I can also just leave in the batter skull if my opponent wants to like empty me, which is something they, they do a decent portion of the time post sideboarding. So I could do something like leave the batter skull in, pull a mirror and crusader out, or like pull out one random piece of equipment. Or just pull Flickerwist because he's not amazing. Two, four. Yeah, something like this is is probably about right. Uh, this hand is average. Um, rest in peace can really muck with ant, so I'm willing to keep a hand that has a rest in peace um, as sort of the two drop of choice. I'd prefer Thalia or Canonist or Revoker over it, but since it messes with Cabal Ritual as well as Past in Flames, that, that is sometimes enough. On the draw, I might have mulliganed for something stronger than that, though. Of note, I probably should have led on Cavern over Snow-Covered Plains on the off chance that I draw like a Caracas as my next draw. I could be playing around Massacre. My opponent did not shuffle with the Ponder. We get to rest in peace them. And we can push damage with Mom. We don't have anything to protect right now. We don't care if this Mom dies. Alright. That's fine. Annoying. But fine. Uh, 
Uh, now I have to choose whether I want Aethersworn Canonist or Sanctum Prelate. I think since I have this rest in peace, I'd really just like to shut off all of the fours in their deck. Like, rest in peace plus shutting off four should pretty much do it. Like, either with the Prelate or the Canonist, they're going to have to get it off the table before they can win. If I draw a land and I take Canonist, I can both Canonist and Stoneforge in the same turn. But I think I'm going to get Prelate. So there, there is a chance that if I, I prelate on 4 or prelate on 2, that either one of those could be beatable with their hand. Um, but with Rest in Peace already here, like any other level of disruption is probably enough to keep my opponent off balance enough for me to win. Like, this Dread of Night is kind of annoying, but I have plenty of outs to it in my deck. Like, I can, I can counsel Judgment to that, or I can just play things like G-Stone Forges and, and get there. Uh, so my current plan involves Prelate this turn, Stoneforge for Sword of War and Peace the following turn. Alright, go all therapy away the Sanctum Prelate. You bet. My opponent still has priority in his thinking. It's not necessarily good for me. So we deploy Stoneforge Mystic. I will get the Sword of War and Peace. It is going to swing the life totals by very, very large percentages. Like, the, the Stoneforge attacking right now is, is whacking for 7 with the Sword of War and Peace, and gaining me another 3 to 4 life. So my opponent is kind of kind of floundering around, likely due to the rest in peace, but I'm kind of floundering around due to their dread of night. So uh, we're we're currently in this awkward dance. Uh oh. All right. So they are chain of vaporing their own lion's eye diamond in order to build storm count. So I can sacrifice a land and bounce their Dread of Night, um, but it seems an awful lot like they're going off, and if they're tight on Storm, I don't want to give them another card that they can actually play. Okay, so they're just going to make goblins. Um, but I should be able to beat these goblins with the Stoneforge Mystic that is currently in my hand. Like, they must be banking on me not having Batter Skull in my deck.
We'll see if I get like super super mized by them drawing Cabal Therapy this turn. Ooh, no. Hold on. Reset blockers. Don't block. Dread of Knights in play. I would I would die there. That was that was almost really dumb. Really glad I caught that one. That would have been embarrassing, chat. I didn't actually do it. Figured it out. I really wanted to draw life uh, uh, words. I really wanted to draw a land there so that I could put this Sword of War and Peace on the Batter Skull. So if I, if I block again, my opponent has 10 that gets through, and I go up to 9. Do I need to just play the Flicker Wisp to get rid of a token here? See? So that brings them down to 9 tokens, or excuse me, that brings them down to 10 tokens. I get to block 2. Uh, I do need to Flicker Wisp. Or I, sh I should say, Flicker Wisping and just getting rid of a token is safe. Alternatively, just Stoneforge Mysticking and putting another body into play is fine as well. Uh, so I can Flicker Wisp my Stoneforge and get another body. Or no, that doesn't that, that doesn't actually do anything because the Flicker Wisp dies. Yeah, I'll, I'll just Flicker a, a, a Goblin token here. So I'm going to do this rather than play the Stoneforge, because the Stoneforge can block and, like, it'll go and tutor up another thing. But, um, it doesn't actually, like, deal with one. It just chumps one. Now my opponent, you know, attacks in with everything here. I block two different duders. Am I really just going to get tendrils for those last couple of points after all of that work? That is so disappointing. That is so disappointing. <sighs> All right. So be it. Sorry, I, I messed up a row in my spreadsheet. I need to fix that real quick. 
So against blue black reanimator, that was Crusher. We delete these two, those don't matter. So it's on the draw, and I won here. And then this column needs to go down there. Alright. So that was Frizzial. P H R Y Z I E L. So game one. Who wins? Game two. I win with. Uh, Bears. Game three. Loss. Two. Goblins, and then they drew ten minutes. So we need to fix these middle rows. Play loss, draw, win, draw, loss. Okay, sorry about that, folks. That was a little, little annoying. Luck, luck has not been on on our side this afternoon. All right, won the dial. So we're playing against Fra 44. Uh, looks like they were they were on Blue Red Delver in May of last year, so they may or may not be on Delver. But it wishes us good luck, and we're gonna mulligan this hand because again, it has no lands in my 24 land deck. <laughs> This hand is pretty reasonable. We will be keeping this one. Um, I think I want more business rather than more lands. Our opponent f6 so they do not have a counter spell. And I'm 100% wastelanding my opponent since they led on a non-basic land against me. So this does does suggest that my opponent is indeed playing uh, Blue Red Delver like they were uh, went with their last finish. Ooh, preordain, you say. That uh, might be Sneak and Show instead of Delver. bottomed both cards with the preordain. Um, my opponent is on blue-red Delver and is just like playing a miser's preordain, then I'd really like to throw a Jitte into play right now and give them a chance to daze me, but my opponent is probably on Sneak and Show. Um, if my opponent's on Sneak and Show, does getting a Jitte into play matter? Probably not. So, like, I Stoneforge my turn. The following turn, I put in a Batter Skull, and then I start attacking with that. Um, I might end up wanting to sort of fire and ice more. I'm not quite at the point of the game where I need to go and weave up this Caracas. But if my opponent is on Blue-Red Delver, there's pretty big upside of me, like, getting a Jitte into play. So I'll go ahead and, and do that.
Since my opponent bottom bottom with their preordain, they are probably missing something from their hand to go off, assuming they're sneak and show. Badlands is very interesting here. I might actually be playing against a Storm deck of some variety. Who is just on a weird draw. I guess it is also possible that my opponent is on a check pile deck that just happens to have a uh, a preordain in it. So this seems to suggest to me that my opponent is going to have a call against command to take care of this batter skull. Which will be annoying. So if my opponent does, does something like land, call against command, destroy my batter skull, and... Oh. Well, things are looking fine. Okay, that's annoying. So this is the one that's on three. I'd say always no to that. Okay, um, I'm actually just gonna pass the turn rather than like put the Crusader in and equip it. I would prefer it to be a surprise. Um, If my opponent passes the turn with three mana up, I'm going to tap my Aether Vial on one before the one on three. That way they might try to, like, Culligan's Command, make me discard a card and blow up a piece of equipment. I kind of want to use this opportunity to put the Crusader in and play around the Culligan's command like I talked about. Uh, this will open myself to getting the Crusader Liliana of the Veiled, though, which is slightly annoying. I can also just draw a card with Horizon Canopy and see if I draw exactly Mother of Runes. No, I mean, if I vial in the Crusader, I'm weak to Liliana of the Veil sacrifice mode. If I have a call against command, they might respond to it right here to keep me from getting a mom in play. They don't. 
Um, I, I think this is uh, some sort of check pile or Grixis control deck. The, the main deck engineered explosives. Fire? Okay. No, what I'm talking about is if I activate Vile, and in response to that, they K command, blow up the Vile, make me discard. Or I guess I can... Oh, oh no, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. Not the best draws. It's fine. Uh, but our opponent doesn't know that we have a blank in hand. Like, to them it just looks like we're representing absolutely everything with these ether vials. Stoneforge is great. No, I don't want to bounce the Batter Skull until I can actually um, cast it. I don't want that getting stuck in my hand and just like getting thought seized out or hymned out or something like that. I would love to draw Flicker Wisp. I'd love, love, love to draw Flicker Wisp. But another Stone Forge is fine. Sure, you can lightning bolt that. And I'm fine with just using this as a lotus petal. And we'll try to make this stone forge immune to red removal. My opponent is probably playing Snapcaster Mage, so we'll give them this opportunity to Snapcaster Lightning Bolt, but if they don't have it here... More fire! Jeez! Alright. Thalia is solid. My opponent on like a standstill deck, and that's why they have these fire ices. Just gonna 
throw that out there. Opponent is on mono removal dot deck. I agree. Uh, so I, I'm going to call them Grixis Control for the moment. And we win versus Grixis Control. So game one, we have three equipment. Um, and it didn't really what we won with. As soon as we found a spot where we could wiggle through their removal, anything we connected with was just going to take over the game. Um, so I'm going to bring in an extra piece of equipment. It's probably good. And I think I'm going to... I think I'm going to bring in these rest in pieces. I'm going to assume that my uh, my opponent is probably playing Snapcaster Mage. And I'm going to bring in kind of these cards that are generically good against control. Afternoon, uh, afternoon Star Streak. Thanks for, for tuning in. We're playing against Grixis something. It's some sort of control deck, but it's a little bit wonky. Uh, so against a control deck, we can uh, we could probably go down one land. Uh, actually, I'm boarding in a lot of big stuff, so maybe not. Um, although the games are going to go long. I don't know if these revokers are good. Like my opponent might be playing a Jace or something like that, but if they're on that much removal, then like maybe I just need to board those out preemptively. Maybe I go down a piece of equipment, and maybe I drop a Crusader since they have like infinite copies of fire in their deck. Is Prelate even good here? That's a fair question, actually. No, that's that's a real question. Like it might sound kind of funny, but since our opponent showed us both like fire and lightning bolt and presumably they have like deluge and fatal push as well uh prelate might not be amazing like it's not going to be bad uh, but i haven't seen like what my opponent's win conditions are yet so maybe Maybe I'm supposed to keep in another Crusader. Cut a land to go back to 23 and run something like this. We'll, we'll revisit it when we uh, see more of what my opponent is doing. I'm getting so punished by mulligans today. Alright. This is a this is a great six card hand. We have this Thalia on top. We have, we're gonna like between this hand and the Thalia, we have a really strong turn two into turn three curve. Uh, there is a chance that my opponent is less controlling than I think they are, and that their deck is full of things like. Uh, young pyromancers and gurmag anglers and stuff, and we might get punished for the way we boarded with things like Cataclysm and the Swords to Plowshares coming out. Um, but I'm guessing my opponent is closer to a control deck than not. I will be very interested to see what this Cabal Therapy hits. Very, very interested. Stoneforge Mystic. Um, do I want to Wasteland my opponent? If I don't, I curve Thalia into Prelate. If I do, then... Uh, Like, I kind of want my lands, but a lot of times with these opposing decks, like, you can wasteland them once and just completely gimp them. I think I'm fine with wasting. 
Like, I, I have more lands in my deck than my opponent does. Yeah, I'm a little surprised they... They took the Stone Forge. Like, given how much removal they have, that might be a sign that their hand is a little bit weak. Waste, balls of steel. I, uh... I agree. No fear. Get him. Alright, so there's a there's a young pyromancer. Uh, so we will we will definitely adjust our sideboarding um, with that fact in mind. Uh, snow covered plains is a split between plains and snow covered plains to play against an opponent blind predicting us. I'm not gonna attack here. Uh, I'm just gonna gonna hold back. I expect that my opponent is gonna have a removal spell for the Thalia, like one way or another, so it doesn't particularly matter which way I do that, attack or not attack. sort of unfortunate that we have this horizon canopy in the face of a young pyromancer aggressive draw. Uh, for anyone who tuned, tuned in in the last couple of minutes, we weren't entirely sure what my opponent was playing because all they showed us in game one was removal spells and lands. So we thought they were a, a very sort of homebrewed control deck, probably. All right, my opponent thought seizes me, they get one of either Thalia or Stoneforge Mystic. I don't think they'll take the prelate here. Yeah, I'm hoping my opponent forgets about their Cabal Therapy, you know, in all, in all honesty here. Yeah, they did not forget. Grix's control via, via 2007. Yeah. Now, if my opponent has the uh, the fifty thousand removal spells that they showed us in game one, we're uh, we're super dead. No, no, I I haven't. It's so the the snow covered plains versus plains is sort of a best practice thing. In all likelihood, it is never ever ever going to actually happen in a game. But because it is marginally better, it is something you should do. Yeah, this 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 poorly boarded cataclysm might work out. Um If I don't want to cast the cataclysm, I just hold this land. Or excuse me, I I uh I crack horizon canopy and I try to draw a two drop here. But if I plan on casting this cataclysm to like leave my opponent on one land then uh, then I don't crack Horizon Canopy. I don't think I want to crack it on my turn either way. There we go, we'll put a Cavern on Human.
like my opponent playing another land. That part I like. Oh man, I hate Selfie Thalia so much, guys. I hate it so much. But when I bought the deck, I didn't pay attention to what versions of the card I got. The opponent has so much mana. And so many cards. Uh, kind of want to see if I draw a land. If I draw a land, I'm going to jam this Cataclysm. I'm going to jam it so hard. Just trying to think if I want to take the Violet for three or not. I think I do. Well. Okay. I know this is slightly awkward if we end up being on the Cast Cataclysm plan because we might make this go away. But if my opponent has any real counter magic, they kind of have to hold it back for this Cataclysm as of right now. So I can just start getting in there with this Thalia. But they should have infinite removal in this deck, and this Thalia should just die. This Thalia should have died a billion D turns ago. I have no idea how it's not dead. Oh, that's, that's money. That's money right there, folks. So it's, it's super awkward that if I equip this sword, I can't actually blink the Thalia with a uh, sort of War and Peace, though. So there's that. So here's to hoping that my opponent uses a removal spell right exactly right here. Alright, so now we have this giant death machine here that is ready to punish my opponent for still being alive. Equip Wisp! Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I don't really know what's in my opponent's hand. They're doing an awful lot of nothing. Alright, they lightning bolt and get the Thalia off the table. Okay, that seems reasonable. Alright, they get to Cabal Therapy my Cataclysm away. That's also fine. Like, we're hitting them for 8 next turn, and then they're dead the following turn. So, uh, 
if you're not familiar with playing with Sword of War and Peace, there are some really neat things you can do with it. Here's one I really like. So we draw a card with Horizon Canopy now, so that we can gain an extra life off of Sword of War and Peace. So I can get a Prelate here, or I can get a Thalia. I kind of like getting a Thalia and just playing Thalia and Wastelanding them. I kind of like getting Thalia rather than getting Prelate to play around Days. Like, my opponent, I think, showed us that in game one. I'll get Thalia. So we'll play a Thalia around days, and then limit their ability to have a follow-up play. And I'm going to get rid of Underground C, uh, so that they have to fetch, fetch if they want to Fatal Push. Alright, and we got that one. Alright, so we are on the draw, and we win. So game two, we, we won that with Sword of War and Peace. Uh, that, that allowed us to clock them very quickly and deal with their uh, young pyromancer. So we are currently 2-1 in this league, doing A-OK. -okay. Uh, a couple of you were asking about the deck list, so I'm going to leave that up for just a second here. Uh, I'm going to refill my water and then get back to it. All right, back in the queue we go. Thank you for waiting. You don't keep days against DNT? Yeah, I generally think days is a pretty bad card against DNT, but lots of people keep days against DNT even when they're on the draw. Happens to me all the time. So folks, if you have any uh, questions about the, the deck list or, you know, what I've been up to or anything like that, feel free to throw those in the chat. Everyone keeps asking about this Elspeth, and I would love to see it in play so I can actually gather some data on whether or not it's good. That would be, that would be wonderful. I've been blown out by someone having Spellpierce post board before. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So, how do I, like, put this delicately? 
it's dangerous to assume that your opponents are good. Like, it is very dangerous to assume that your opponent knows how to sideboard optimally and how to play the matchup optimally. And and sometimes it's a little hard to tell whether your opponent is is taking a line that is bad or, like, if they've sideboarded badly or if they're unfamiliar with the matchup. Um, and yeah, sometimes I get absolutely blown out by by someone doing something that's like absolutely terrible and you should not ever do it, but it somehow works out and it ends up being perfect in those weird uh, situations. Have you given any thought to Blessed Alliance in the red build? So um, here's the, the deck I played in a league previously, and yes, there is a Blessed Alliance in it. Um, that is a card that can answer true name Nemesis while still being a removal spell against most of the stuff in the format. Um, it's not particularly good against Deathrite Shaman, but it's good against most other threats. It costs two mana instead of one, uh, and it can sometimes be a little awkward when you have Dahlia. But having a card that is an out to, um, to true name is, is sort of important. Day seems like it's good exactly when it can hit a, hit a vial. And then it can even be medium if the rest of your hand is good. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, I, I think days on the play against death and taxes is absolutely justifiable and, and probably even good. Uh, on the draw, it is... Um, the term I usually use is ambitious. playing against Pyrogeny, which I guess is a pun off of Progeny, but with fire. Uh, I am very likely keeping this hand against whatever my opponent is playing. It has double vials and a lot of gas at three. Uh, and I don't have any data on what my opponent is uh, playing, so I'll, I'll keep this one. Not great if my opponent is playing combo. Not atrocious, because I can like recruit her for a Thalia or something like that. Alright, my opponent leads on Windswept Teeth, and I draw a third Ether Vial, which is not what I want to see. My opponent is doing something like playing DNT, um, and they revoke me, I'll feel pretty bad. Alright, my opponent fetches a drop. They spell pierce my ether vial. I will not pay for that. So current theory is my opponent is on infect. This is not a great hand against infect. So like I'll get to stick this vial next turn, and I'll eventually get to the point where I can hold a flicker wisp off vial to be safe against stuff, and that's nice. But if my opponent, like, has an early creature here, I am in trouble. Sylvan Library. Still probably in fact, but... Super sad to see my opponent having that. My opponent has a counter spell. Yeah. So what I was about to say, um, what I was gonna if my opponent has a counter spell, like a daze, they probably need to use it on that second vial so that it's not just dead for the rest of the game. So we are hoping to draw. Alright, my opponent has gotten aggressive with their Sylvan Library, as they probably should. Oh, fantastic. And we're not going to get cute and try for a blowout. We're just going to remove the Glistener Elf. 
I see a lot of people trying to get really cute and just like win games mid-combat step after the opponent has used a couple of pump spells. Don't. Play safe. Because when your opponent has like vines to vastwood or a force of will and you just die, it feels terrible. We're actually not in that bad of shape, all things considered here. Um, I'll start getting scared if my opponent takes more cards with Sylvan Library. You know, if they if they draw a few more cards this turn or something like that, um, that probably means that they're real close to just comboing off. <sighs> Uh, so this is game one against this opponent. We don't entirely know what they're on. But this Mirror and Crusader resolving would be real sweet. Come on. Come on. Yeah, this, this, is, this is the first game. Uh, our opponent is on Infect. That's, uh, that's probably pretty obvious at this point. Uh, just uh, straight blue green. In fact, you know, I I haven't seen anything that would suggest that they're flashing another color or anything like that. Um, it's possible that I might see a tundra at some point this game for swords to plowshares in the sideboard or something like that. That's something you can do. Uh-oh, that's bad. So my opponent attacking in probably means that they're just going to try to kill me through Mirroring Crusader. In which case, I'm just going to block with both of these on the off chance that the one extra point of blocking matters. All right, there's a become immense. Where's the berserk to follow it up? Yep. So the good thing with my play is that we only went to fifteen infect instead of. 16, in fact. That might, uh, that might be relevant. Alright, so we're playing against Infect. So we'll bring in Path. It's removal. We bring in Canonist. It keeps them from, like, really going ham with Berserk. We'll bring in Council's Judgment. Uh, it's slow removal, but it's removal. And... Prelate is a maybe... I could even see boarding in Elspeth here if I have enough things to take out, just because it's a card that can generate infinite chump blockers, but probably not on this one. Like, Prelady isn't even that great. Alright, so what are we going to board out? We're going to board out Revokers. They're only good against the Mana Dorks. That's, that's not where we want to be. What else? Board out the Batter Skull. That's, uh, this is not the matchup for that. 
I probably don't have anything good enough that I want a recruiter for. And that card's pretty slow. Maybe Prelate isn't even that good. So, like, we don't have a lot of cards we want to take out, so we're not going to board that in. And if I just board out the main deck Prelate, then that leaves us with this. So, Prelate's sort of awkward in the matchup, because on one, it stops the Berserk, and it stops the uh, the Vines of Astwood, but it doesn't go and stop things like Invigorate or Become Immense. So the... Like, what do I want if not the prelates, though. Like, what would I take out for the prelates? That's that's my question. Because I think all the rest of this stuff I kind of want. Like, I could trim a Thalia and a Flicker Wisp or something like that to keep the prelates in the deck. I don't know how good prelate actually is. And if I put prelate on one, it also stops my removal. Uh, so I'm going to submit without prelate. Sand is great. Yes, Infect is a very hard matchup for us. Alright, so we're playing against Infect, we're on the draw, and we lost. So game one, we lost to Invigorate, or not Invigorate, uh, Become Immense and Berserk. Alright. Again. Lead on snow covered plains because the art is baller. Alright, now we have the question of whether or not we want to use the Swords of the Plowshares on this Noble Hierarch. Does Prelate actually close the game, though? I don't know that it does. Part of me wants to just Swords to Plowshares the Noble, so that Thalia can come down, and I can port my opponent on the following turn, and just kind of play the mana denial role. Um, but that line is pretty bad if my opponent follows up with an infect creature, because I don't have a removal for that. Like, especially if my opponent just goes, like, land blighted agent, then I can't actually deal with that. Um, overall, this kind of makes my mana awkward, because... Like... Hmm... I can just jam Thalia here, but again, if my opponent just plays an infect creature with their turn, I haven't really taxed them at all. I think I want to play Thalia. It's unfortunate that if I play Thalia, I can't, like, both Swords of Plowshares and Port in the next turn, and I won't get to, like, use an Aether Vial activation on two. It makes the best use of my mana if I don't play Thalia this turn. I don't think I want to Swords to Plowshares, but it's close. I can just port my opponent also and buy time, which is not unreasonable. If I port my opponent, then I can... Like, Swords to Plowshares is a threat that they play and Vile and Thalia and port them. So I think I actually like porting them better than anything else.
because if I port them, then I can, if I port them this turn, I can Swords to Plowshares and port and put in Thalia next turn and just have a better use of my mana overall. What does chat say? I would port definitely. Another vote for port. Uh, vote for not Swords to Plowsharing. Yeah, I tend to point my Swords to Plowshares and other removal only at Infect creatures whenever I can in this matchup. If my opponent were to miss on a land drop, say, then then I would be fine with using a Swords to Plowshare on the Hierarch, but otherwise I just try to fight the creatures that actually matter. Alright, Pithing Needle, you got it. Uh, this is the second game. We lost game one to Become Immense and uh, Berserk. Alright. So this all is going to work out pretty well for us. So we source the Flasher of this Glistener Elf, and then we cast our Thalia. Sort of unfortunate that Aether Vial got Pithing Needled, and we drew a second one. So be it. Sure. I'm okay with that trade. Yeah, it's sort of unfortunate that if I was going to get rid of the needle, I didn't do it pre-combat. Um, but I guess it's fine, because now I get to get rid of it and play another Aether Vial. I'm gonna go ahead and just like deny my opponent the mana here. I don't have anything to save or get value with this Flicker Wisp right now. And we'll do the mana off the Noble Hierarch so that I can't sneak in damage. Let's see, I play Vile and Port there until I have more information to cast Council Judgment maybe next turn. That's fair.
Sure, we're, we're open, but our top decks are much better, because if we go and top deck something like a Stoneforge Mystic, then we, like, vial and Stoneforge, cast Jitte, equip Jitte, and the game is over. I'm going to give him the old tap of the Aether Vial on 2 first, even though that doesn't matter. You know, just as a stifle check. Always nervous by this point. So we have our de our opponent dead on board. Um, so I'm gonna just work on denying two mana here. Throwing this council judgment at a noble hierarch is pretty awful. Um, but I'm going to get rid of a noble. Uh, port a trap, and that'll probably do it. I think it was better to wait those good draws before taking a decision about Council Judgment. That can also buy time with an immediate threat. Yeah, like I don't I don't blame anyone for taking a different line from me on that one. Like it's it's very anemic to go and uh, use it in that way. So if my opponent finds Berserk here, they're only dealing me 14. So my opponent would need both Invigorate and Berserk to kill me. Invigorate would put me to 26, making that a 9-9, 10 when they attack. Uh, nope, nope, not dead to Invigorate plus Berserk. Am I dead to Berserk plus Berserk? Berserk plus Berserk would... Yep, okay. Don't need to think about that. All right. So game two, we're on the draw, and we win. So we really won by removing the first threat.
Like, yes, that is a game that, like, technically Flicker Wisp and the Mirror and Crusader, like, won. But it was actually getting that Glistener Elf off the table that won us the game. Because if we didn't do that, then we ended up, like, just dying to that Glistener Elf. They had a ton of pump in their hand, and if, and if that thing connected, we probably lost. Um, we were, we were talking about the prelate before, and I don't think the prelate is necessarily good. Like, when you put it on one, it shuts off all of your removal and your vials. Uh, when you put it on something else, you're just shutting off cards that aren't necessarily four ofs in their deck. Like, you can shut off Become Immense, you can shut off Invigorate, uh, it's not necessarily the best. Uh, like, is that card better than a Mirror Crusader, which is a quick clock in pro green, or a Flicker Wisp, which can be tricksy? Hard to say, but I think I'm going to leave them in the board. Again, the uh, Elspeth to create infinite jump blockers seems tempting, uh, but probably not necessarily good. Like, it's really slow, and it's not good against Blighted Agent, which is the scariest card in their their deck anyway. Board in one prelate for a land. That's reasonable. Like, if I'm not playing the recruiters, though, then I want to naturally draw it. Like, do I want to naturally draw that? I don't I don't think I necessarily do. Right, but like I... Oh, right, there's the lag, so you didn't hear me just talk about the whole one-drop scenario. I think I'm going to run this back as is. Uh, it's not that I've stopped playing the red-white version. It's that I'm experimenting with a couple other things. Like, I wanted to see how I felt about the 24-land mono-white build um, after a few matches. Um, I really like the red-white build. I think it is very, very good. Um, I don't particularly like Revoker just for Noble Hierarch. Like, on the draws where they don't have a Hierarch, it's super awkward. So I'm gonna lead on Mom here. Um, I want to tag a real creature, a real infect creature, with this, uh, this Swords to Plowshares, if possible. Although if my opponent does nothing of real worth on their turn, then it's very possible that I'll Swords the Hierarch and Wasteland them. Oh, folks, we might have a really fun turn. This is a Blighted Agent. Oh, man, we're gonna Swords the Blighted Agent, Wasteland the Nexus. Uh, don't put that on Wasteland. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't put it on Wasteland. Don't do it. Ah, uh, But Mom was right there. This Jute is sweet. Again, I have the opportunity to get Risky and Wait and Swords to Plowshares on their turn, but then I'm playing into so many things between like Spell Pierce and Binds of the Vastwood and all of that stuff. Um, I won't actually be saving myself any Infect damage by Swordsing this now, because my opponent can just animate the Nexus and then swing in, but it's unlikely that I'm going to die this turn. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just, just get rid of it now. Again, this matchup's all about playing nice, nice and safe. 
not dying. Play around as many things as you can. So, like, doing this now plays plays around Days, Spell Pierce, and Vines. What does chat say? Chat says the same thing I did. Uh, and someone asked about the Miracles matchup. Um, the Miracles matchup is a lot harder than it used to be. Um, they have fewer cards that we can interact with now. Like, it used to be that Phyrexian Revoker um, shut down top and could sometimes really, really make them stumble. Um, and we don't have that luxury now. So, Revoker ends up being a relatively dead card in game. Like, yes, I understand that it can shut off Jace the Mind Sculptor, and that's that's a thing that really does matter. But it's not something that, um, how do I say this? It's not something that is necessarily going to work. And if you have to play the Revokers out as early pressure, they're not going to be around when your opponent actually gets to Jace. Uh, I feel like the best time to port an Ink Moth is in response to an activation. Because uh, if you do that, then your opponent gets to go and, uh, like, has to use a removal spell, or not a removal spell, uh, a Vines to Vastwood in order to get to attack with that creature that turn. So my opponent has a Sylvan Library. I might be dead or very close to it. If my opponent gets to draw a bunch of cards off the Sylvan Library, I am in really bad shape. So my plan is to get Jitte counters on... To, is to get Jitte counters and use that to take over the game. I'm in this awkward state where this port may or may not do anything. So my opponent might tap Trap to animate Nexus. I'll tap Nexus. They'll tap Nexus in order to activate their other Nexus, and they'll still get to swing in. So if they have things like Invigorates, um, it's really bad for me. But there's not a lot of upside to just jamming a Stoneforge this turn. So I think what I'm going to do instead is just like hold up the port and be representing a lot of things so that my opponent is fearful of going for it. And then I'll plan on just using the mom as a suicide attacker with this Jitte on the following turn. Uh, and I'm going to play out the Wasteland because we might eventually get to the point where... I counsel judgment away this pithing needle and get to wasteland a trap. So how many cards is that for my opponent? Both, both of them? Yeah. Not a good sign for the home team. Fendelhaven is also really, really bad. Uh, so I'm going to do something kind of cute here. I'm going to float a white and then undo it to make my opponent think that I might have a source to plowshares. And then I'll just go and tap this. And my opponent animates the other one. And that's fine. They'll pump it with Pendlehaven and then attack in.
Now they're brainstorming. Uh, me randomly floating the white might, might make them scared of just going for it here. I do have the opportunity to just like double port both of my opponent's ink moth nexuses. That's probably something that doesn't win me the game though. Like it, it'll it'll keep me from not losing in the immediate future, but my opponent has Sylvan Library. They're gonna get to look at a lot of cards. If I get Jitte counters on, my opponent can activate both ink moths, swing in with both ink moths, I'll get one of them. And I can get the other on the following turn. It will leave me dead to any pump spell. I, what does chat say? I think that if you do not try to win there, you're going to lose the library. Yeah, I agree with that. Like, double porting my opponent means that if they draw Blighted Agent or Glistener Elf, I or even just uh, Binds of the Vastwood, I die. Uh, I'm going to play out the Wasteland again, or if we draw a White Source for Council's Judgment, we can double Wasteland, which would be sweet. So here we go. Let's try to get Jitsei counters. Does my opponent have Force? That's super bad for me. Does my opponent have Daze? Still abysmal for me. Does my opponent have any Pump Spell? Still bad for me. I am, I'm hoping my opponent's hand is Fetch Land, Fetch Land, Fetch Land, Fetch Land. It's kind of where I'm at. Jitte connecting is money, but I don't know that it's enough money. Like, we might be at the high rollers table, but I love the fact that my opponent is casting this ponder and not just killing me. Hoping for a shuffle off this ponder. They shuffled off the ponder. Cross and grip me. Cross and grip me. Make me cry. Well, that's pretty bad. Mm. 
No, I'm not going to wreck the hierarch. I just want infect creatures off the table. Like, my my out to this game is essentially my opponent not having invigorate and me drawing a white source so that I can get the, uh, the pithing needle off the table and double port. Uh, so now that I'm at 7 Infect, and both of, like, either Nexus connecting is lethal with Pendlehaven and Hierarch, um, I'm in the position where I do need to double port my opponent. Uh, Pendlehaven only works on a 1-1. One -one. That's why. We won't. We won't port now. We'll, we'll be good. We are probably just going to drown in the Sylvan Library. But we're giving ourselves a chance to draw a white source. So many things to click through. And I don't want to just F6 because I want to, you know, at least pretend like I have another removal spell here. Alright. Blighted Agent is a problem. That means that if I draw a, uh, a white source, I, I have to Council's Judgment away the Blighted Agent. Ugh. So the only way I don't die is if my opponent doesn't go for the blight, the kill with Blighted Agent. It's not a great position to be in. Yeah, I'm dead. I'm gonna pretend like I'm not dead. But I'm dead. Oh, that's a bad attack. My opponent just will tap the Pendlehaven on the Blighted Agent. They might think it's a trick. I was gonna concede this one for the, for the sake of doing interesting things on stream. I'm real dead. Uh, am I going to the Philly team open? I think so. I feel like I'm going to that. I haven't been really good at looking ahead uh, and seeing what my schedule is. Okay, we, we lost a Sylvan Library. And a Needle on Waste. Uh, this hand looks pretty good. We'll probably keep this against whatever my opponent is doing. So I'm, I'm on the draw, and I'm playing against Ali. Who 
was last seen on check file. This is a reasonable hand against check file. It's not great, but it has a stone forge and a crusader, so that's the combo. And if my opponent leads on a death right, then I have removal for that. Batter's Call is not a great draw, but an acceptable one. Sword of Fire and Ice is the card I want for this matchup, but I'm actually going to get Jitte on the off chance that, like, the Stoneforge dies, I cast Crusader, and then I go turn 4, Crusader, Jitte, equip, and then kill on turn 5. So for that reason, I'm going to get Jitte. Uh, it's pretty likely that the Stoneforge just eats it right here. If the Stoneforge doesn't eat it, then I get to put in Batter Skull, which will be sweet. Dak Faden, the greatest thief in the multiverse. We have discarded Force and Brainstorm. So I can revoke Dak and play Mom this turn, or I can continue on my line of just planning to beat them to death with Crusader. Um, sort of the neat thing about revoking Dak and playing Mom is that if my opponent has only one removal spell, they have to choose whether they want to get the Mom off the board or the Revoker off the board to unlock Dak. And then I would love to have Mom in play before this Crusader comes down, since my opponent is on a Bolt deck and might even be playing something as silly as Punishing Fire as well, since that card is sweet with Dak. Or I can, like, Revoke and Waste them as well. My opponent might be on some random Delve Threats since they're playing Dak, so wasting my opponent might not be, the, like, the best thing in the world. I can take my opponent off red if I do waste. I kind of have a many, mana hungry hand myself, and I would really like to have four mana for like Crusader plus Jete equip. But until this DAC is dealt with, Crusader Jete isn't the the greatest thing in the world. I think I'm going to present them with two different threats that they, or two different cards they have to answer. So first we'll, we'll start with the Revoker. We name Dak. We play the Mom. Yeah, that's kind of why I'm valuing getting this mom in play. If if my opponent is on like the punishing fire build, it's scary. You're just gonna like deluge me or something. 
because that'd be super sad. All right, you deluge me. Yeah, there's a punishing fire. There's a grove. Terrifying. So my opponent has sort of correctly realized that they should go ahead and uh, put the Punishing Fire in their hand now instead of tapping out. Uh, we will we will start by wastelanding that Grove. We're not dead. So we'll wasteland the Grove. They will get one use out of that Punishing Fire. We'll play a land, and my long-term plan for beating this DAC is not good. Uh, since I have like double artifact in my hand, it's awkward. But I don't think I win if I just ca cast nothing this turn. I think I need to play the Crusader into their Punishing Fire and just let them have that. Well, they can kind of steal it with Dak. Uh, so for those of you who don't know about that... Uh... Tilt. Uh, so anyway, about Dak Pain and Batter Skull. Uh, they gain control of the Batter Skull, but not the germ that it's attached to. So it's kind of awkward. Because if they get a, a creature in play and can then equip it, super bad. Uh, I'm not going to just throw this Jisse onto the board and let them steal that, though, because then something stupid like a Snapcaster Mage will just take over the game for them. Oh great, that's glorious. There goes that batter skull I needed. So I can reset the loyalty on the DAC, and then this flicker was just dies. I can play the Jitte, make them steal it, try to flicker wisp it back, but that can backfire really badly. I think I'm going to hold the wisp for a turn and not play the Jitte. Sad trumpets? I agree. Sad trumpets. Oh shoot, I thought Dak's ultimate was negative eight. That was a that was a mistake then. But if my opponent has like yeah, okay, that's fine. We'll just concede that. All 
All right. So we lost there. So we we lost to to P Fire and Grove. Lost stack. Any one of those things might have been beatable. The the second Grove uh, was was really rough. All right. So what are we bringing? We're bringing in a sword. We're bringing in some rest in pieces. And we're probably just like bringing in this giant pile of stuff, honestly. Gonna board out the swords of plowshares. They're not particularly good. We'll probably board out the jitte. It's not as good as the other uh, other removal we've got going on here. I guess I can trim some number of Mirren Crusaders since my opponent is going to be heavy on red removal. Like, I'd probably be fine cutting about two of the Mirren Crusaders. If all of our stuff is just going to die to removal, then I'm probably fine with trimming a Flicker Wisp. And then that still puts us over on cards, though. So I can board out a land here. And then we have to make one more trim. So you say a stone forge? I am bringing in, like, another very relevant piece of equipment, though. Like, do I just go down to one Crusader? Or, yeah, do I go down to one Crusader? Like, it closes out the games the quickest, which is sort of why I like it. That all is probably fine. Let's try this. Uh, this is a hand that needs to draw another land. Not a great hand. With the... With another land, this hand becomes fine, but not great. I will probably keep this hand on the strength of the Mother of Runes. Mother of Runes you know, denying the Punishing Fire Lock is probably good enough. But, so I'm, I'm going to keep this. It, like, we have so many live draws. We have, we have 21 lands left in the deck. So if we hit a land, this is great. If we hit a two drop, this is still great. If we draw, like, another three drop or something, it's awkward. If we draw a vial, it's fine, because I can, uh, like, wasteland my opponent and then play a vial. So most, most of our draws are still really good, even though this hand is awkward. Alright, Cavern is a great draw. Uh, and I don't actually want to show them the... Uh... No, I think I don't want to show them the wasteland. I want to make sure this Cavern gets into play, so we'll put that on human. And pass. Uh, what is our opponent playing? Our opponent is playing Punishing Dak. Uh, it's essentially a Grixis control deck that revolves around Grove of the Burn Willows and Punishing Fire. Yes, it, it is a Dak Payton deck. So I'm going to start by throwing the Sanctum Prelate on two. My opponent might answer it, but if they don't, it's great for us.
uh, in addition to stopping like the punishing fire side of the deck, it also stops like some of the random two drops they'll play, like Rise Fall. Uh, it's going so 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 far. We're we're two and two. We're uh, we're down a game against punishing DAC, uh, which is probably not where I want to be. All right, there's a DAC, Hayden, greatest thief in the multiverse, here to fuel the graveyard and be annoying. If I draw a land, I am snap cataclysming. I think. Oh, rest in pieces. Glorious. Like, pretty much literal best draw here. Uh, before I do anything else... Oh, no. Oh, no, I can't cast the rest in peace. That's awkward. That's awkward. Oh, well. This will be good later. This will be good if things start going wrong. So, there are currently no lands in the graveyard, so I don't want to wasteland my opponent because it sort of puts them at mana parity. Uh, so instead, I think I want to just jam this Crusader. He's hard to deal with. He's bros. I don't want to play the sword into the deck. Got real excited about that rest in peace chat. My opponent has a lot of dig going on. Things can definitely go wrong. But I'm not super sad if this prelate, prelate falls off the board. If it does, I get to rest in peace, follow up with Wasteland. And if this DAC ends up living for a few turns, I will get to Cataclysm it. Opponent discards Brainstorm and Force of Will. The second Grove is really good for my opponent because I can't just waste slam them off of their combo. Alright, get rid of Prelate and I discard a card. Uh, assuming my Crusader sticks around, I want this Sword of Fire and Ice. So I think I'm going to discard the Recruiter. Don't have lightning bolt. Don't have lightning bolt. Alright, the DAC is gone. We will cast a rest in peace, which hopefully doesn't get forced. It does not get forced. And now we're fine wastelanding our opponent. Our opponent might have a Punishing Fire to get the Crusader off the board, but if they do, we just follow up with a Stone Forge and go get Batter Skull. Alright, I have, I have gimped my opponent on mana here. Alright, Diabolic Edict. Solid. I sacrifice Mirror Crusader. Second main phase. Throw the stone forge out there. Uh, 
There is an argument for getting Sword of War and Peace, but I think I want the diversity of threats. Alright. So the Stoneforge Mystic ate it. Now we just need to draw a land. We'll miss on a land. We can miss on a land for a while. Pernicious deed. That is annoying. I'm not gonna get cute by holding this Thalia and like trying to get my opponent to the point where I can protect this with Caracas because once I hit a third mana, I have so many other things that I want to be doing. If my opponent accepts my two for one trade here, and like deeds the Thalia and the rest in peace right now, that's actually fine for me. And if they don't, I get to hold up the Caracas and then still be pressuring their life a little more than they are mine. So I, ex I fully expect this to be the deed activation here. Push. Then push. No, my opponent is on uh, punishing DAC. They just uh, decided to play a uh, pernicious deed in their deck, which is what I call ambitious. Jace is annoying, but again, as soon as we have a land, we're not worried about the Jace. Like, we can Council's Judgment away this Jace. If that fails, we can Cataclysm away the Jace. Not overly worried. Alright, uh, I really wanted a white land there. I guess I should have been a touch more specific. But we'll, uh, we'll play the land that gives protection from Jace and from Punishing Fire. Might get super punished by opponent just like backing and taking it, but whatever. Oh great, it's just Liliana on the last hope. This Cataclysm is going to be fire. Yeah, this, uh, this Cataclysm is gonna be sweet. The Prelate, less so. My opponent really wants their Deathrite Shaman back.
Naming five with prelate is reasonable to stop force of will. Ugh. Actually, I don't think I want to cast another piece of equipment if I'm going to Cataclysm. Because I'm only going to get to keep one. Snapcaster targets ponder. Sure, you can ponder. I don't really know if I like Snapcaster ponder there. I think my opponent should just hold the Snapcaster to have Snapcaster force the will up. Or like Snapcaster bolt or Snapcaster fatal push. I think the, the utility there is really important. Frustrating. So I... I put this 24th land in the deck. And I keep sideboarding it out in the control matchups where the games go long and I should draw lands. Um, and I've sort of gotten punished for that today. Which has been very frustrating. Like, I still don't think we're dead. Uh, if my opponent doesn't have a force of will for this cataclysm, it just wins us the game. But we're on something like whiffing that white land. Something absurd, like six or seven turns now. Well, that doesn't really do enough. sort of annoying thing is that nothing I get here really matters because some combination of Lily and Jace will just get anything off the board that I get. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get a Revoker. If I actually get to Cataclysm and my opponent keeps a Deathrite Shaman, then I will revoke that. Remember that game where the only thing we drew all game was land? Pepperidge Farm remembers. Tutor up a Knight of the White Orchid. Sure. And my opponent has also assembled the Punishing Firelock right now. Great. And I also need to discard. Uh... I guess it's Batter Skull, because like we're never ever ever getting that in play. But Flicker was... I guess if I draw a Stoneforge post Cataclysm, that's fine. So I guess it's Flicker Wisp. It doesn't matter. Like, this game is going to come down to whether or not my opponent has Force of Will. Uh, 
opponent keeps both their cards. If this was a real life match, I would just ask my opponent whether or not they have force, and then if they showed me, I would concede. But that's not really how it works on Moto. Alright, there's Leovold. Cool. Uh. I play this Thalia knowing 100% good and well that it is going to die. Punish my opponent will punish the fire it. I'll bounce it. They'll kill it again. I don't know why my opponent keeps minusing this Liliana. If they had just kept ticking it up, they would have killed me with zombies by now, but I'm not going to complain about it. We're kind of hitting the last turn or two here where I can uh, actually draw a land for Cataclysm and win the game. So my opponent is presenting 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 on the next turn. My opponent is responding to me wastelanding myself. I'm going to respond again by wastelanding my other land. And then we'll lap six. Man, funny, you didn't even have anything to do to me that was terrible. Alright. That was a... That was a rough league. So game two, we never drew second white source. And we lost because of it. We're on the play and lost. Ah. Alright chat, that was not the best set of matchups there. Um, relatively speaking, we played well. But, uh, you know, variants kind of got us for the bulk of today. Uh, draws weren't particularly great. I don't think the deck list was necessarily bad or anything like that. It just uh, didn't work out. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and call it here and get some dinner. Uh, I probably won't stream again tonight, um, but it's likely I will do a stream sometime this weekend. Uh, thank you to those of you who subscribed today. I really do appreciate that. Um, 
for those of you who didn't know who I am, I'm Phil Gallagher of Thraben University, and thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and find somewhere else that I can uh, dump you all into and give someone else some uh, views on their channel uh, that is doing leg legacy content. Who's playing some legacy right now? I guess I can give Hoogland some views. There's no one else. Lots of people know who he is. Let's give this random person some views, I think. They'll appreciate it. Uh, did that command not work? Or is it a slash? Slash host? That didn't work. Do I have an extra space there or something? Maybe they went offline. Okay, it was just super slow to go through. Alright, there we go. I've, I've dumped you all on some legacy content. So, hope you enjoy. Hope whatever's there is actually good.